Well, hello, everybody. Um, uh, let's see here. I work for the government, so usually when I go to conferences, people don't have as, as cool shoes as you all do. So this is one of my first sort of examples of really being in a very different place. But uh, I'm super excited to be here, and I appreciate you uh, letting me come and talk to you a little bit about, um, about community development and, and our partnership with the Robert Johnson Foundation and, and, and maybe ways in which we can collaborate. Um, so uh, I'm going to... Can you raise your hand? I think I can barely see, but can you raise your hand if you know a community, if you've, you're familiar with that term, community development? It's sort of, wow, a lot of you do know that. Well, yeah, okay, good. Well, well basically, community development is um, an effort to revitalize low-income areas of cities, and it really becomes an issue when cities get their start, which is about the late 1880s and 1890s, when people are moving in, and something, some, something that happens that makes life very difficult for these new immigrants into the city are that they are coming in and competing for jobs, which is driving down the wages that they can earn uh, in, in those cities. At the same time, they're competing for space and places to live, which is driving up rents. And, and, and slums are really the result of that. And so this happens in all cities and all places uh, and all times. And so there are many different responses to that. Um, and in the course of American history, we've had things like the settlement houses in the 19th century. We had um, uh, the progressive era that was called municipal housekeeping. Women, by the way, have always dominated this field, so that's part of why it has these sort of gender uh, uh, overlays to it. But um, you have the New Deal programs, that's where public housing comes in in the 1930s, and then you have uh, the War on Poverty, the Section 8 program in the 1960s, and something, a kernel that becomes what's the current system in, in how we try to revitalize communities, uh, the, the, the invention of the Community Development Corporation. The first one is the Bedford-Stuyvesant Stuyvesant, uh, Restoration Corporation, founded in part by uh, Robert Kennedy uh, in the 1960s, but was really an effort to try to create a local institution that local people controlled that could kind of help them chart their own economic destiny. And that's, that's really at the, at the heart of community development. Um, I uh, wanted to talk to you a little bit, but, but to give you an overview before, just to, give, just to orient you about the, 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 the scale of community development. You know, Bedford-Stuyvesant was the first uh, of the CDCs, but now there are uh, 4,000 of them. Um, they're also kind of these sort of companion groups, community development financial institutions. Uh, they're kind of like a nonprofit bank that they also help into low-income communities. There's about 1,000 of those with about $30 billion under management. Um, you have uh, a number, there's a very dense network of uh, different uh, uh, sort of institutions, local governments, foundations, uh, community groups that are all part of the, what we would consider the community development network, including uh, the banking system. Um, the banks are motivated by the Community Reinvestment Act. And when you think about the, um, the amount of money that goes into this work every year, it's pretty sizable. It's not enough, but it's sizable. Um, so you have uh, about the subsidy programs, their tax credits and block grants that go into that, and they amount to about uh, $15 billion a year, and that attracts other sources of capital from CRA motivated banks and uh, pension funds, insurance companies also are investors in, in low-income communities. You also have foundations, state and local government. But the, the ballpark figure would be about 80 to about $100 billion a year. Um, but what I want to talk to you today about is sort of three eras of community development and, um, and really focus in on what I would call the modernist era, which is I would date from about the 1920s to the 1970s, early 1970s. Uh, that's more of a top-down, bureaucratically run model in community development that gives way to something that uh, I'm, I call it postmodern period uh, of community development. This is the 80s to the present. And, and, and the third period I'd like to talk to you about maybe at the very end is this sort of third period, this third era that we're entering now, which is, I, I, we, don't, we don't have a very good name for it. Uh, um, Morgan suggested post-postmodern. Maybe that that would work, but uh, but we almost uh, we think about cumulative impact. But it, but in essence, it's going to be a period. It's going to be an era that requires we have much broader um, collaboration, a network of networks um, working to try to revitalize low-income communities. So so let me dive into that that modernist period. Um, well, basically. Uh, you have, uh, here's Cor uh, Le Corb Corbusier, um, and, and, and uh, alongside here is his design for Paris that he had decided to, do, to sort of make some adjustments. We all know what dump Paris is and needed some fixing. And here you can see the 
Il San Luis in uh, the Latin Quarter, and what his plan was was to bulldoze the Latin Quarter and develop these towers in the park, he called them, these tall buildings that would solve the problems of congestion in Paris. So you'd sort of, they would be much healthier places because you have access to air and light. Uh, there would be recreational opportunities because you'd free up areas uh, for, for, for that. Uh, transportation would be easier. Um, but this is certainly, if you could see the, the, the modernists, what I love about modernists is they, had, there was, they could use reason to solve problems, and this is really what Corbusier is trying to do. He's trying to solve that problem that the city represents in terms of creating a decent place for people to live who are uh, low-income workers. Now, um, you also have, uh, here's the machine for living and the inspiring some of the, this is a early uh, affordable housing development in Queens. But this sort of the international style and this sort of modernist thinking was really influential in this, this, this period from the 1920s to 1970s. Um, Max Weber, I want to switch a little bit here and talk a little bit about institutions. And Max Weber is really sort of our leading light to t teaching us about bureaucracy. And you may not believe, you may not think this if you've been to the DMV lately, but the advent of, uh, of bureaucracy is really a dramatic and uh, important stage in human development because this is the first time you have an institution that's sort of running a sort of government program, not because you're the king's nephew or you're part of one tribe or another tribe. This is because this, this is an institution that has rules that are written down. You can read them. You have, uh, they have, um, you advance through certain sort of procedures. Uh, and, and they use reason to try to identify a problem and solve it. And so you can see these sort of, these twin inspirations of both uh, Corbusier and Weber, sort of in, pre in, in pre present, rather, uh, in the work that's being done in the 1960s to try to solve the problem of slums in the United States. This is a photograph of the Prude Igo homes in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and, and, and it's looking pretty familiar, right? I mean, here you have the, the, the these are the towers in the park. Uh, you have recreation, you've got a school, there's a church, there's public transportation. This is a community that makes a lot of sense um, on paper. Uh, one, one problem, no, no one who lived there was ever consulted about what they wanted and the kind of community they lived in, but, uh, but this is pretty impressive. And in fact, this is really, in many ways, was a model for, the, for many other projects all over the country, and some of them are uh, famous and infamous, in fact, you know, the Robert Taylor Homes or the Cabrini Greens, things like that in Chicago. And so, these sort of modern structures were being built all over the country. And, and what's interesting when you study, and the, the Department of Housing and Urban Development is founded in 1965. And, um, and what's interesting when you read those early reports from HUD is that uh, there's so much confidence, you know, and there's a forward uh, there in one of those early famous reports from HUD where Lyndon Johnson says, you know, the United States has conquered space, has created abundance in the, mar in the marketplace, and will eradicate the slums. You know, boom, 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 we're gonna take care of these problems. And um, this is not just, these are not just empty words. These are actually, the, the government's actually backing this up with some real resources. In fact, the HUD budget between 1965 and 1969 goes up ninefold. So it's a dramatic increase. Um, and, and then what you find is that they start building a lot of apartments, about half a million apartments a year by the late 60s and early 70s. And many of those apartments are decent, safe housing for low-income families, but a lot of them are ending up like this. This is the Prude I go about 10 years later. And so you see what, there, there was, now design was blamed for some of this, and I'm sure you are all familiar with some of the, the, the critiques. There was things like, there was too much anonymous space or indefensible space, as it was called at that time, and that that was sort of made people more prone to antisocial sort of activity. Um, but there was all, the bureaucracies were also to blame. And so you could imagine if you were the um, manager of the Prude Igo and you're in a situation where you see this, it's starting to unravel, you know, what's your response? Well, what you do is you write a letter to the regional commissioner in Chicago who forwards it to the property management committee in Washington, D.C., who sends it up all, you know, all those boxes that you just saw a moment ago. So you get to a decision maker and then it comes back down those decisions, all those different boxes. And that becomes a real problem because years could go by and this was still going on. Right, and once these things get entrenched, it's very hard to, to turn them around. Um, the other thing is that the, that the bureaucracy is having trouble um, allocating resources effectively. So you had situations where um, the federal government, uh, HUD is building 10,000 apartments in a part of the town when 
uh, you know, south side of Chicago where 10,000 apartments had been abandoned by people who had lived there before. They were perfectly inhabitable, but they were, you know, there was just this kind of mismatch with where the resources were going, where they were needed. Um, and I often think of this as sort of like, if you have a mouse in your kitchen, it's like trying to get rid of it with an elephant gun. You know, it's like by the time you sort of, you know, lower the barrel and pull the trigger, you're blowing holes in your wall. Meanwhile, the mouse is scurrying away. So it's sort of the wrong, the wrong tool for the job. Um, why don't we go back one? There's, um, there's a slide in here somewhere that's not the next one, but uh, <laughs> that, that is, um, and I wonder if the folks backstage can bring it up. It's, it's a, 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 a picture of the Prude Igo demolition. Um, but it, what, what, what is interesting is that sort of um, Christopher Jenks is a Harvard professor. He writes in the, this book, The Language of Postmodern Architecture. He says he can date the moment when the Prude I go, I'm sorry, he can date the moment when modernism ends, which is 3.32 p.m. on July 15th, 1972. And that's the moment when the Prude I go was demolished. And I, I used to have a photograph of that, but it's, it's, it's somewhere hidden in the deck now. But um, Basically, what, um, what I argue, and this is something that's, that, that, that's in a, a book I wrote on the history of community development, um, that it, what was going on there was not only were those modernist structures dynamited, but the institutions that built them, the bureaucracies that built them were dynamited as well. And, and then you had yourself, it was a dark period in, in, in community development history because it was just not clear exactly what was going to happen next. And what was interesting and a surprise, I think, to many was that when the government retreated, many people in local areas, in, in their local communities, didn't accept that retreat. And uh, local groups banded together and in church basements and, and union halls and coffee houses all over the country, groups banded together. Start, many of them started nonprofits that are big institutions today, but they ended up uh, creating a response where that was locally controlled, locally driven, many times using community development corporations as sort of the lead. Um, but this group was just doing, I mean, on a shoestring, was really making some inroads into revitalizing these communities. And so you had a situation where the policymakers in Washington, D.C. were taking a step back and saying, wait a minute, this is, this is kind of remarkable. Um, you've got a, um, uh, uh, these local groups are doing things that we couldn't do. Let's see if we can find some ways in order to sort of, to sort of get more money into that inchoate network. And so basically what happened was, you had a situation where um, through those block grants and tax credits and other sort of backdoor mechanisms, you had something that was what the bureaucracy was replaced with something that was more like a network. And you could have a situation where you would have an activist in a local community could, could sort of appeal to a community development corporation, another node in this network, and say, you know, there's a, this, this building needs to be revitalized, this, this slum building that we were struggling with that's bringing down the community, that CDC could apply to the state for tax credits, could sell those tax credits to a, to a uh, corporation. You had banks involved, foundations, local government. All of these different nodes within the network were feeding back information, subsidy, market rate capital back to that community and helping them helping them get by. And, and that was a, that's a really important shift in how community development work gets done. I want to just go through a few examples just to make this a little bit more real. And one is, uh, this is the Frank G. Marr apartment that was built in um, Chinatown in Oakland. Um, it, it, the, the project was um, interesting. For first and second generation immigrants, uh, it, was, it was built by the East Bay Asian Local Development Corporation, a local nonprofit. And they were looking for a way, half of it is rented to families, low-income families, the other half is to seniors, and it was really intended to try to keep some of these extended families together that were, that were evident in that time, uh, in that community. Um, I, I wanted to sort of show these two side, uh, these photographs side by side, uh, just to give you a sense that the, the only thing that's really changed in, you know, from the time it was built to now is they've changed the um, color, it's a little bit darker, and uh, it's been painted. And the trees got bigger and the cars got bigger. You see everyone's driving an SUV now. Um, but this is a, uh, with instrumental revitalizing uh, the, the, the Chinatown neighborhood in Oakland. Um, another example, this is just a stone, literally a stone's throw from here. It's on 6th Street. It's called the Plaza Apartments. It's a, it's a project designed. It was uh, started by a, a nonprofit started by the city of San Francisco to build housing for people who were form, formerly homeless. Um, 
One thing that's amazing about this project is that it has uh, one floor is all just clinic rooms and case manager rooms. Um, and so the clients, the, the tenants who live here get quite a bit of service uh, from, from, from that staff. But what's particularly interesting is San Francisco is unusual for a lot of reasons, which is why I like to live here. But um, one of them is that it's a city and a county. And so counties typically are the ones that pay for uh, county hospitals and the, have the health care bills. Cities often the ones that have the sort of housing bills that the, and the community development bills. In this case, in San Francisco, they're one. And what we found was that uh, when they built this, these series of supportive housing projects across the city, that they were saving a tremendous amount at the hospital from people not visiting the emergency room when things got difficult. And so this is a huge cost savings to the city of San Francisco. I think another thing that's sort of dramatic about it is that you have, um, I was interviewing one of the nurse practitioners who worked there, and I'm saying, you know, tell me, tell me what, I mean, this has got to be a tough job. What's, give me a, 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 a story that really, reason why you work here. And she said that she was, it was a holiday party and somebody was, um, somebody had brought in a karaoke machine and so the, all these tenants were singing, you know, all these like so 70s ballads, you know, uh, together. And, uh, and sh this is a bunch of people who were totally rejected by society who have for the first time in their lives a real community that's, um, that they feel at home in. And you think about, I just try to think like, well, how would that work? Like at HUD, is there a karaoke procurement sort of department or, you know, for humanity in this, in this system? Um, this is another example, and this is my last of the housing examples, but this is outside of San Diego, but it was partly, part of the construction was financed by the local utility, was trying to encourage um, the adoption of um, solar panels in, in construction. And so this project, all the roofs are, are solar panels. And so no low-income family in this project pays a utility bill, which I think is a really interesting way in which community development sort of um, goals, social objectives are matching up with green environmental ones. So there are some problems with this approach. I'm not saying that this is the cure-all, but it, it, is, it has been very robust. But the problems are that it's incomplete. Uh, there's a need for more resources. Um, it's dependent on a strong, strong economy because in many cases you have to sell tax credits to corporations um, and it needs to be better coordinated and linked to other policy areas, which I'll get to. But the, I think the one thing I really, I mean, the one takeaway I would really like to keep with you is that it's this amazingly adept institution that, create, that connects local knowledge to these larger systems. Um, it's also got a winning political coalition, which is interesting because you get these nuns and Wall Street bankers together and they do this lobbying that would make a defense contractor blush. Um, now it's used in other areas. This is an example with a small business development. This is a Market Creek Plaza in San Diego. It's, uh, this is a, a, a shopping center. Um, this was a contested area, a gang contested area, and, the, and the, the, the moving force behind this was the Jacobs Family Foundation, and they said, look, um, we, we, we want to go in this area, but we know it's gang contested. They started talking to gang members and said, what do you need to make this neutral territory, and they said we want uh, jobs for our members. And uh, what's amazing to me is that gang members were part of the planning process for this project. Um, it inc includes a, uh, a grocery store in what was formerly a food desert. It also has, um, as you'll see a lot of the, the design features, it was many of the people who live in this area are from southern Mexico and have some nostalgia towards Mayan architecture, so you see it's sort of trying to capture some of that. Um, there's another, th this, this model has been used in the construction of charter schools, and now it's being used with uh, community health centers and with uh, grocery stores in food deserts. Um, so then what, what, what I sort of was hoping to bring to you all is this, this question about what comes next. And, and this is part of what, um, we've made early uh, efforts at this with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. They had this commission to build a healthier America where they did this very interesting report. Um, and they showed that in many ways, the, your Ill, bad health or premature death had very little to do with your health care. In fact, it was really things, and some of it was attributed to, to, to your your genetic disposition, but in many cases it was these other issues around your behavior and your social environment and your, the physical environment. These are things that happen in the neighborhood. These are things that, it, that, that, that are, are, are really place specific, which kind of brings you to the startling conclusion that, uh, that, they, that, they, that they try to bring to light is that your zip code is more important 
than your genetic code in terms of your health and, and how long you'll live. Um, and community development is in the zip code improving business. So I think we've got a good partnership there, but it's not enough that health combines with community development. We need a bigger tent. We need a bigger group of people um, working on these problems. And that's why I'm excited to be in a community that I'm not that accustomed to, uh, to, to hear your conversations about this. Um, and, and, and one of my, this is my slide from the matrix where I sort of feel like that, you know, those points of time where if you could put those goggles on that would show you where all the dollars were flowing, where all the subsidy dollars were flowing. There's actually quite a bit of money going to some low income communities, but it's not as well spent as it could be. It's not as well, it's not, um, it's, it's often focused on outputs and not outcomes. It's not twined together in a way that gives it more impact. And so that is gonna be the real challenge of this third era is to try to bring those pieces together. Um, I am out of time, but um, I guess, you know, the, the real key is in this third area is this integration, and I, and I, and I, and I guess wanna, I'm going to end just really quickly, because I think it sounds complicated, but in many ways it's really not. It's really pretty simple, which is, um, I, I think about my, this is maybe too much information to share in a public forum, but my, my parents got divorced when I was very young, and, um, and they kind of were, it threw family into kind of a furor, but, um, you know, you, they didn't have to be geniuses or superheroes to make sure that everybody kind of stayed on track. I mean, it, basically, a school bus came to my street corner every day, took me to a school where, where teachers and coaches cared about me. There was a supermarket nearby. There, were, there was recreation opportunities. There was very little crime in that place, and this is not a wealthy neighborhood, but it was, but it was certainly uh, one that, that, that had the amenities that made for a healthy life. And I feel like when I look at this photo, this last photograph, I just think that this is, it's, this is it. We need to sort of get to the point where every school, every kid in this country has access to that. That no matter what their circumstances are, no matter what kind of condition they were born into, that they can lean on those systems, whether it's education, community development, the transportation system, the, the public safety and health systems, so that they can sort of, so that they can have the, a life of choice and opportunity. And so I really appreciate you taking the time to let me speak to you, and um, I think Morgan's gonna come out. And